Time, it's time, I suppose, to exhibit a wonderful lineup of shows. And I must disclose that this lineup of shows will make you feel good from your head to your toes. Now, Full House's first of four shows to be hauled deals with Jesse and marriage. His thoughts are twofold. His heart says yes, yes, but his feet get real cold. It's time now to watch the Full House plot unfold. Hey everyone ever, and welcome to 20th Century Pop, the show where we try to understand the present uh, while living in the past. My name is Tim Blevins. And I am Bob Canning. Tim, Mm -hmm. I'm back on Facebook. I know, I saw, we discussed, we didn't discuss, we discussed when you got off Facebook. Right. What was that? When was it? It was the end of December. And went in, okay, and then you got and you're back on. I am, and it, one of the first things I saw was was uh, one of those, you know, uh, what were you doing in high school um, questionnaires that people fill out. Well, it was you public know, like, high school. You had to go. Well, like what, not what were you doing there, but what were you doing while you were there? Uh, like who you dated, you know, did you skip uh, favorite class, that kind of stuff. Which was a nice so, distraction. So the epitome of this technology is what you witnessed. Uh, yes. And honestly, it was a nice distraction from everything going on in the world. Okay. Uh, and it ended with, the last question was, would you want to go back and relive your high school years? Um, and this person would temporarily go back, mostly just to hang out with those friends. Aren't you this person? It's your Facebook feed. No, I didn't fill it out. I read somebody else's. Oh, the person who had posted it. Oh. Yeah, the person who posted it. Mm-hmm. And uh, in reading that, that's kind of a good feeling. And right now, it's kind of what I wish I could do. I wish I could go back even six weeks ago and relive a better time. <laughs> you mean prior to reading that that person wants to go back to high school? How old was this person? Is this person still in high school? No, this person's our age. 40, young 40, I'll say. Okay, I'm 44. Yeah, it's a young 40. Okay. And they want to go back, but with their knowledge of what it already was? That's the that's the fantasy. That's the perfect scenario that I think everybody would uh, accept. Most people would accept that. I would do that. I would go back to the, to the 90s as a young man uh, with this uh, 45-year-old brain and, uh, and, you know, do everything... Again, better. So you don't want to experience it new. You want to experience it again. I would do. I would do it again. I would. I would do it differently. Mm-hmm. I would change it up. I would sacrifice. I would sacrifice my present to see what uh, you know changing my past would have brought. So you would create an alternate time where you never traveled back there in the first place. Correct. I thus suppose creating, that's true. Um, a paradox of existence. Correct. Yes. Oh, okay. That's my goal in life. To create paradoxes. Huh. That's a that's a big segue to have committed to paper. I, I <laughs> seem to have gone smoothly. So so you're back on Facebook and your friend cracked time travel? Uh essentially, you know, of her okay. mind. The All time right. travel of her mind. And that's the period you would choose, high school. Um no, that was the period um in this uh survey that she filled out. So she's doing a time travel survey. No, she's doing a survey. Um, well, she did and already will have to done. To relive to, to, and to retell and to share some of her favorite experiences from her high school years. So she um, was just bragging. I suppose, Tim. Yeah. yeah Are you happy I, that you're back on Facebook so she could brag to you? I'm, I, it's been brief. It was really like one of four posts that I looked at. And I was trying to use it as... As a segue here of going back and reliving moments. Like our podcast. Like our podcast and specifically tonight's uh, topic. It's a su- specific reliving of a night, a date in history. Oh, wait. So was what we're talking about tonight, is this something relevant to your high school years? No. 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 Okay. Well, actually, yes. Yes. This is? Now that I'm rethinking about when I actually went to high school, yes, mm-hmm. I was in high school. Well, um, what what what's what's tonight about? What are we? What's happening now? What we're doing tonight, Tim, is we are reliving 
one specific night of ABC's, thank God it's Friday, TGIF lineup. Television history with an actual date. That's right. That's right. Tonight, today, on this podcast, we're doing a binge-in podcast of TGIF. And what what was, what is... For our listeners who maybe don't know, what is TGIF? TGIF was the must-see TV of the 80s and early 90s. Um, but instead of being Thursday night television, it was Friday night television. And instead of being NBC, it was ABC. And instead of being uh, adult-centric sitcoms, I think it was more family-oriented sitcoms. Um, and, and yeah, that's, that's how I remember TGIF. Yeah, it was a two-hour block of time. Uh, officially premiered September twenty second, and did you watch TGIF? Was that was that a programming block you are or were familiar with? I did. I don't think I watched the full. You said it was two hours. Uh, I think it was eight to ten, and then wow. twenty twenty followed that at ten. I don't know that I always watch the full set, but there are are several um, series from the the long run of TGIF that I did watch and follow. Um, including a couple um, from this evening. Okay. From yeah, this I, evening, October 5th, 1990. That's right. We're watching four, we watched four episodes of what would have been new episodes, brand new episodes of the second year of TGIF, which was not something I watched. I was in ninth grade when this was on. I, I'm sure I was still watching TV, but I think Friday night's I don't know if I was with friends. Maybe we were renting movies, role-playing games, sleepovers or something. But TGIF is not something, while I'm familiar with the shows in it, it's not something I watched a lot of. Maybe I caught an episode of something here or there. I didn't go out on Friday night, so I've seen a few episodes, a few more episodes, I imagine, than you have. Well, let's see, because we both saw four, and boy, do I want to talk about that. (laughs) Okay, good. So we're going to go by Eastern Standard Time, right? This East Coast, we were East Coast viewers of this. So so for us, it ran from 8 to 10. It might have been different on the West Coast or or, or for the television station in, in Minnesota that uh, showed it. But for us, uh, TGIF, ABC, um, started at 8 o'clock with a show that we've discussed, I think, before, a show that I think you were a fan of. Um, the 8 o'clock show, the kind of the, the flagship title, when I actually think of TGIF, and the one that held uh, held ground there for a couple of years, Full House. Yeah. And the episode we watched was entitled The IQ Man. Oh, real quick, just in case people don't know, what's the premise of Full House? What would you say the show is about? Uh, Full House is essentially about a widowed uh, family man who has three daughters, um, and so to help raise these three daughters, he has his uh, best friend, uh, Joey, and his brother-in-law, Jesse, come oh, with him. that's the relation. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So Jesse is the brother of the deceased wife. I knew that. That was more for listeners. Why are you putting me on that spot, Tim? That's not a spot. That's that's narratively uh, sound. Well, but if you knew it, you should just say Podcasting. It. Well, you're, you're talking about who the characters were. I know that there's a there's a Danny Tanner. And I know that there's a, a DJ, right? Somebody's a DJ, maybe yeah, Joey Donna is. Yeah, Donna Joe. Donna Joe is one of his daughters. Mm-hmm. And there's a there's a Stephanie who's the middle child, the Jan Brady of the, of the group. Yep. And then there's a little baby Michelle. Oh, that's her name. Yeah. Anyone um, else? I knew maybe that. I knew on that. the show. Anyone else who gets a, a shout out in the in the credits, perhaps? Um, in the credits, uh, in this season, uh, Aunt Becky. Yes, Sam Becky, Becky is, there. is a character who's yeah. a co-host of a show with Danny Tanner on uh, Wake Up on, San Francisco. That's not just advice. That is the show that Danny Tanner's on. Yes. So Full House, that sounds like a great premise. I like that premise. Oh, it's great. Yeah, it came came after uh, Three Men and a Baby. It, it, I think it got some inspiration there. I could see that. I could see that. And so I think this episode is... Uh, three seasons in, maybe season three, season, season four, f- season four. So four seasons in, yeah. And like TV shows often do, this episode started with a little, uh, a little what do you call it, a teaser. You know, something yeah. you know you're tuning in right at eight o'clock. You just sat down, you got your cocoa puffs for some reason, or a pop yeah. tart, or non breakfast food, and uh, you tune you, you tune in. You're sitting there, and what do you get? You get Michelle. The youngest uh, uh, of, of the children. That's right. Reading to a dog. That's uh, correct. In her bed. 
uh, secretly, I guess, torridly secretly. I heard her dad, Danny, uh, Bob, Bob Saget, as we know him, comes in. Yep. Uh, he wants to say goodnight. Uh, he goes to kiss his daughter, Michelle, but he, I think he kisses the dog by mistake. Right. Um, apparently, there are no dogs allowed in the bed. I guess it's a there rule be? that – I don't know. I guess it's because it's a rule. They established yeah. it early. Um, and so with that being said, Michelle, the, the youngest, looks to the dog, Comet, I think is the dog's name. That's correct. Um, and declares that you're in big trouble, mister. And that's our teaser. That's, that's our teaser. That's that gets us into the show. That is the that is the season three and four for sure. That is the typical teaser. We always open with Michelle and sleeping with a dog. Uh, yeah. Well, not sleeping with a dog, Tim. Hiding the dog, wanting the dog to be in her bed. Dad is calling to Michelle, and she's like, "Oh, hide, quiet." And she gets under the covers, and and that's why uh, when he opens the covers to give her a kiss good night, it's the dog instead of Michelle. And the dog's in big trouble, mister. Totally. Now, you're in ninth grade watching this, if you want uh-huh. to go back to when it aired. Were you, did you find that amusing? Were you um, happy? Like, I'm so glad I tuned into this. Yeah, I, I, uh, I did. Really? I can't, I can't tell you why exactly. Is it because the dog was in why. the bed or because the dog was in big trouble, mister? It's because the dog was in big trouble, mister. Mm-hmm. Um, That's the joke. I guess the joke first is the Danny joke, kisses the dog. Th- there's not really a joke there. The joke the is audience the, thinks there is. There's a little after. The 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 entertainment comes from Michelle being absolutely adorable, cute as a button, and and saying these kind of grown up ish stuff. Um, not like risque grown up, but just you know why would she tell the dog that she's in tr- you know trying to convince Mister. dad that it wasn't her fault. It wasn't her plan. It was the dog's plan. That's that's funny. That's funny. Okay. Well, then and there adorable. you go. Then in ninth grade, I see why you enjoy this. We get that little teaser. I would say it's 15 seconds tops. And we jump right into a uh, very, to me, very familiar opening credit sequence. A pretty great song. Yeah. Pretty great shot of where they're living. They're living in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. And they're driving a car. And uh, there's three kids in the front seat. That's not. Could you do that? In uh, no, there's two. There's two in the there's front two, seat. But still, plus not, Danny. Okay, not that's nice, that's not, a lot. Not the smartest thing to do. What's nice about the opening credit, besides the song, which is very recognizable, is we are seeing where they live. We are seeing San Francisco, and everybody you know gets a still shot, so you know who you're watching. Um, who's Joey talking to in his shot? I feel like they're all just kind of still shots, but Joey is in the midst of some sort of his hands move in. Yeah. It's probably some witty little comeback, but to who? It's a holdover from um, earlier. This is a, the season four opening. Season one and two opening, um, they were all basically at a park. And so they go to the park at the end of this opening, which we're spending uh, a lot of time discussing. Sorry, that was my choice. Yeah, no, um, it's it's a very memorable opening. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, they're across the street from their house, essentially, uh, at the end of this opening. In the previous opening, they're at a a park further away that's that's not really around any houses. Where Joey goes to talk to himself? No, no, no. The whole family is there and they intercut uh, Danny talking and the girls talking. And so I think it's supposed to be... In that, in the first season opening, just sort of them hanging out at the park. And so that's the bit that they used. Everybody else got a new clip, and I think they just reused Joey's clip. Do you like Joey? No. I did, though. You did? I did. In ninth grade, I when d- you were I... watching Full House on a Friday night, did you like the character Joey? Were you like, when does Joey come on screen? <laughs> I don't think I was like, when does Joey come on screen, but... I I I like Joey. I you know, I think I've kind of made it clear on on previous episodes that I sort of had an innocent childhood. Um, my mother would always um, have on old westerns and just um, just sort of innocent fare. And I guess still at this age, I was you know leaning towards that, leaning towards the the, the innocent fun stuff. And and so yeah, I still enjoyed Full House. At 16. And that's Joey. Joey is innocent fun stuff. The topic of You Ought to Know off of Alanis Alanis Morissette's third album. That was years to come. I didn't know any of that. Okay. All right. No, I I don't like Joey. Can't stand him. 
Not sure I could stand him back then either. And I always think of him as Dave Coulier, not Joey. <laughs> Jesse, John Stamos, I like them both. I think John Stamos is a talented actor. I'm always oh, yeah. happy to see him show up in something. And Uncle Jesse, I think that's an interesting character. Yeah. I like him. I like seeing him. But Joey, no. No, not at all. So when he was talking to himself there, I just felt like you're just trying to get attention. We're in the midst of learning who's who, where you live, and all you want is some fucking eyes on you. Because you're doing some comical, like, I, I probably don't even know how San Francisco works. What's with all the rice are running? And it's just, it's, uh, uh. I say this because we don't really get much of Joey's character in this episode. But we do get it in these opening credits. I like this song. I think this is a great... Story, you know, like I didn't watch Full House a lot, but I know this fucking song, and that's a good sign of an opening credit sequence. It's yeah. catchy. I like it. Yeah. I wish there was less Joey. Sure. Sh- it's a pretty full house with or without Joey. <laughs> I think all of their lives would be fine without Joey, but he's there and he's in the opening credits and he comes into the plot. But after the opening credits, we do get back into the show. And before, before I think we get to Joey and why Joey's in this plot. Uh, we learn a little something here. We come back probably from commercial in the house. And it turns out that Stephanie, middle child Stephanie, has a cold. So uh, to help her out, Michelle dips fried chicken in the dog water. Right. And offers it to her as soup. Chicken soup. It's what you so, give for a cold. Is it chicken soup? It's, it's dog water. Yeah, I don't know. See, Michelle chicken. isn't too skilled on how to make chicken soup. Mm-hmm. So she just takes water and chicken and presumes that that eventually will become chicken soup. It's adorable, Tim. We cut to the basement of the Tanner house. And in the basement, we see Joey and Jesse working their job. Yeah, it, it, it wasn't really you know, explicitly made clear. But essentially what they did is they couldn't leave the house because Stephanie had to stay home sick. Mm-hmm. From is that why they're in the basement? They don't so just work out of the basement? They do work out of the basement, but but they were on their way out to uh, a client appointment to pitch a oh, commercial okay. idea. A wet client. I'm yes. going to say this client of theirs is pretty wet for Uncle Jesse. <laughs> yes. So because Stephanie had to stay home and because Danny works his morning show, they had to stay home to be there with Stephanie. So they asked the client to come to the um, the house to pitch the show. Why they a pretty did it- flexible career choice that they made. Yeah, yeah. Which was very good. Why they chose to do the the bit in the in the basement and not just in the front room, I don't know. But privacy? there we are. Maybe there's privacy. But Could um, be. so their bit is basically there. They have a client who's pitching something called IQ Man. Is that what it's called? Uh, it's a it's a cologne called IQ. Okay. And their bit is that there's the IQ Man. Oh, that's thank that's you. the man that uh, would sell the. Uh, so it's like the old Spice guy. Um, this is the IQ Man. And so Uncle Jesse's in the robe. He kind of pitches it, looking, you know, all kind of suave or whatever. And this wet client tells Jesse that you need to be the IQ man, which Jesse yeah. is reluctant about. And Joey is all for. Right. Because Joey wants the job. So he is willing to throw his 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 partner out on a limb there and, and force him into this position of being the IQ man for this wet client. I want to know... If I can live with what I know. (laughs) And only that. (laughs) Cut, 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 cut. Jess, the concept is the IQ man, not the IQ head. (laughs) Too bad, the head's all you're getting. (laughs) A little ice cold water will help him over his shyness. No, no need to dry off. In fact, I would like to see your body wetter. The wetter, the better. (laughs) Excuse us, won't you? Joseph, hop on. (laughs) You see, this is exactly what I'm talking about. I'm nothing but a Big Mac and a bath towel. (laughs) Joey, I am not a hamburger. I happen to be a human being. Jess, buddy. As long as I'm the director, you will be treated with dignity and respect. Thank you. Okay, hose them down. <laughs> this kids show, the Full House, this program for, for, for ninth graders, is spending a lot of time with Uncle Jesse's uh, chest. 
Yeah. We're seeing a lot of just John Stamos. Not the kids being cute. Not, not some plot that we're like, oh, I know what it's like to not get on the baseball team or be scared of the library or throw up on lunch. This, 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 this story is basically Jesse bemoaning that he's being exploited by their wet client and, and, and wanting to walk out of this idea and, 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 and uh, Jesse and, and, and Joey kind of struggling with, well, we need the money. We want to do this ad. And then at the last minute, kind of siding with Jesse. That is the drama of the episode. That's the A story. That's A story. <laughs> what they do is they kind of lament that they just quit working with this ad agency. Danny is like, no, guys, come on. Don't don't give up. You guys can do this yourself. And then Becky chimed in and said, yeah, absolutely. And then DJ was there and said, yeah, all you need is this and that. To be clear, all they need is, uh, as it's laid out, is some equipment, uh, some studio space, and some business cards to start their advertising business, which that's just a little uh, bit more than a kid who starts a babysitter's club. I, this, this is a, an advertising agency that they're starting. Uh, Double J Creative Services, I believe is what it's called. That's, that's what they call it. And Danny Tanner, who granted I do get this, they're helping him out raise his kids. He writes them a check to support them. He's, he's a good friend. He believes in them. He said he would do anything for them. And so he's a, a silent partner in their Double J Creative uh, Services. And that's set up. That seems like a big plot point. Maybe that's a that's a real game changer. Yeah. Um, I thought there would have been some like audience applause for that or something. Sure. But yeah. I think what we get is that Michelle sneezes she, on Stephanie's homework because uh, Michelle has a cold. We get a how rude out of that. Yeah. And that's it. That well, there you go. That's that's the end of that episode. That is correct. So, you watched this more than I did in ninth grade. <laughs> yeah. You followed the show. Yeah. What did you think of this? What did you think of this as an episode of um, Full House? Not my favorite. Not a fan. Um, I guess they, they just wanted to get Uncle Jesse and, and Joey into their own business somehow. And this was the the plot that they took to, to do that. Don't care for it. There's no, there's no uh, Aunt Becky Jesse relationship story going on. There's no Danny um, uncomfortable in a situation happening, and and no Joey stand up career hopeful you know dreams. This is this is kind of a one off, which is not really a one off because it does change how uh, Jesse and Joey make their money for the rest of the the series. But uh, plot-wise, yeah, no good. And it's just so glaringly, like, that wet client, like, there was nothing to her aside from just... Dampness. Yeah. It's kind of sexed so, up. Yeah. Like, was that in there for the folks, for mom and dad to see a little bit of, you know, like, you, again, we're seeing a lot of John Stamos's physique. This, this show, this block of children's programming, Definitive Children, TGIF. Friday night, you you don't have to learn math right now. Watch these shows. Well, I, you know, you say children. I I think it's family television. So yeah, the the moms and dads are there, and so you got to give them a little Jesse once in a while. So you you, you throw in a little new Jesse, yeah, to maintain their attention, but take away new Jesse. What is there to this episode that keeps a kid watching? Well, you got Michelle. And Stephanie being adorable because Michelle throughout the episode is trying to nurse Stephanie back to health. And then at the end, uh, the tables turn and now Stephanie has to nurse Michelle back to health. And so there's some comedy and funness there. I think there's too much of, of the this, the advertising sexual harassment jazz, but hmm. so jazz. goes. Yeah. Okay. Well, there are other shows to discuss. In fact, there's other shows on this very night. Oh, my goodness. What was the 8.30 Eastern Standard Time uh, um, selection for yeah, at 8:30 TGIF? Came- it came Family Matters. Did you watch Family Matters? Was that a show you I did. Tuned I did watch into? Family yeah. Matters for a time. Do you remember this particular episode? Um, I don't remember this particular episode. Do you remember it from watching it earlier today? I do remember it from that. But I do want to point out um, another hit, for me anyway, hit opening song. To the theme to Family Matters. The theme to Family Matters. Gotta love that. 
So it's, I think we get a sweeping shot of where they live. They live in Chicago. Yeah. It might be the same singers. I don't know. Um, but you get to see the family um, there, right? Each of them gets their own shot, so you know who's in it. Yeah. This opening credits, unlike Full House, this one looked like it was actually showing episode clips. Like there's actually parts of episodes in the opening credits. Is that, yes. is that true? Okay. Yeah, I believe that's true. Although the, the, the character shots were just for the, the opening. So do you, And you remember this as a theme song? Uh, I do. Okay. Very catchy. A lot of horns. I mean, a lot, there are a lot of horns in uh, this particular program, Family Matters. I know that we've watched an episode before for a Christmas episode, and I enjoyed that. If you go back to 2007. You enjoyed that so I, much. I did. I really did. So I had some high hopes going into this second season episode entitled Flash Pants. <laughs> Is the name of this Family Matters episode, Flash yeah, Pants. Flash Pants. Um, it also has a little teaser at the beginning before the opening credits. Um, it starts right off with uh, Urkel, character of Stephen Urkel, um, stalking Laura. And she can't outrun him. He's at every door. Yep. He came over to the house. I guess he wants to walk her to work. She doesn't want him to walk her to work, which is uh, fine. That's a worthwhile thing to ask someone. He persists, and eventually he decides, all right, you can walk me to work. And we go to the opening credits. Yeah. The Urkel is the Michelle of Family Matters. I don't remember Michelle unhealthily stalking anyone on Family Matters. No, not that. Not or that aspect. Full house, excuse me. But just that fan favorite that we got to get, we have to see right away. Otherwise, we're not actually watching Family Matters. By season two, was Urkel the fan favorite? Yeah, I mean that's why he's he's in this opening, um, and why he's in this show at all. From was from he what intended I, as a main character when the no, show started? No, no, no. From from what I recall, um, he was. There was an episode where where uh, and I forget her name that that he likes. Um, Laura. Yeah, uh, she had some suitors uh, in an episode three or four for whatever reason, and Urkel was one of them. Oh, and he just. Uh, uh, made quite an impression, and so he came back as as uh, um, this stalker character. See, okay, so he because originally this is a, a family show. It's about Harriet, the the mother, Kakaro, the father, and their kids. Yeah, because when we come back from the opening credits, it's the family breakfast together. I like that. It's like yeah. this seems like a good family show. This uh, Full House kind of scattered the family a bit, and the one we watched this one, they're all there. They're all having breakfast together. Carl comes in. Uh, apparently, there's, and I always like this on sitcoms, the amount of excitement an entire family can feel towards a dumb event. <laughs> there's some sort of a dance off. Carl's uh, a cop, police officer. And what's the actor who plays Carl? Uh, Reginald Vell Johnson. Reginald Vell Johnson plays cops in everything he does. So it makes sense. And I like him. I said it on the other episode we watched with him. I like how he shouts all his lines. <laughs> but he comes rushing in and he's thrilled because there's going to be a yearly annual dance competition at the precinct yeah to raise money it's a fundraising event for the for the police for, oh it's okay i didn't know that it's a fundraising I so believe, i guess leave yeah he and harriet dance every year and he comes in and he sweeps her around and they do a little dance right there for the audience which is quite impressive i might add harriet is in very high heels yeah this felt more familiar to me than Full House, even though I never really watched this. This felt like a family sitcom. Right. Um, and you were watching it at this point, right, when this was on? Yeah, I probably watched the first two or three seasons of Family Matters. Yeah, and does this feel like a typical Family Matters episode? It does. It, yeah, it does. I think um, the, the kids are more often the focus than the adults, but this was more of an adult-centric uh, a Carl and Harriet yeah, just like Full House, this one is very centered on, on yes, on, on Henrietta and, and Carl. Because what's the drama? We know that they're going to this dance. What happens? What what sets this up? Well, um, usually it's a it's a great time for for the two of them, uh, Carl especially every year. But this year, the, the dance uh, off at the dance off this year, there was a, a, a new police officer recently transferred to Carl's precinct. And Carl does not like this guy at all. Was he played by the Big Ragu? The Big Ragu. It's the Big Ragu. I, it I, is. Yeah, from Laverne absolutely. and Shirley. From okay. Laverne and Shirley. Sit down. Relax. Tell me what happened. Two weeks ago, this turkey transfers in from the south side. I could tell he was a goober from the get-go. <laughs> and how does this goober? 
Cuba get you? <laughs> Everything's a competition with Charlie. Who's got the best score down the shooting range? Who gets the most collars? Who can burp the longest? I bet you won that one. <laughs> well, of course, but that's not the point. <laughs> Today, Charlie starts shooting off his mouth about how he's going to win the dance contest. He starts telling everybody that he's the world's greatest dancer. Now, that kind of bragging is childish, stupid, and petty. Carl, you are absolutely right. So I told him we're going to wipe up the floor with him. <laughs> Rachel! Is Rachel here? No, she's at work, but I'm sure she heard you. So that sounds like we would be going right to a dance off, but does something maybe intercede or, or stall getting yeah. to the, the Well, they've got to practice, 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 Tim. And during, in the middle of this great uh, practice that they were having, Carl throws his back out. He wrenched. He wrenches his back, cannot stand up, and uh, suddenly everything's in jeopardy. Yeah, right? He's fucked. Totally. Carl is fucked. The solution, the maybe slightly exaggerated solution to him throwing <laughs> out his back is that when he gets back from the doctor, they cut forward a little time. He um, he has a harness that he has to wear, uh, but this harness is hung on a door. Yeah, like like crochet sacks. Yes, not unlike crochet crochet shacks. I can't fucking say that. <laughs> crochet sacks. Crochet shacks? Crochet sacks. There you go. Is that right? That's right. He's wearing crochet slacks. <laughs> yes, yeah, he's hanging he is, on a door. He is hung from a door with his back uh in a in a in a vice basically and you his, ever thrown out your back does that neck, happen i have thrown out my back i i have it's painful well and it looks like it was all i had to do was lie straight lie on my back for like three days uh oh. and and it, it solved the issue for me anyway okay, this well, this contraption yeah i don't know maybe it was a more severe injury but he's just hanging on a door yeah and then i guess urkel enters yeah and he's there to keep... By opening uh, that door. By opening the door, Carl is hanging on. Hilarious. <laughs> and I don't know, were they... From what I understand of the show, this is seasons on, Carl and Urkel get most of their scenes together. They're kind of the foil for each other. Well, I, that, think, I think also with Laura, it's, it's Urkel and Laura. Uh, but then, yeah, eventually they become the odd couple uh, of the series. And so they're put together a lot. Do we ever see Stephen Urkel's parents? Uh, I don't know if we do. I I have no recollection of it. There may be that one episode, but no, I don't. I don't know. I don't think so. Because after the scene where we're do we ever hanging, see Skippy's parents? We never see Kimmy's parents. Yeah, we never see the neighbor kid parents. No, and these kids are basically adopted by the family because Carl and, and Harriet go to the dance off for a very long dance sequence. The family goes, which I get. Laura's there. Um, Urkel comes with them. Yeah. Is he Laura's date, or is he just... I, like, I who wants even, him there? I can't even remember. Maybe they established a reason for him to be there when he was talking to Carl, but I don't recall. They don't, because yeah. I watched it. Laura doesn't <laughs> like Urkel. Carl, invalid Carl, doesn't like Urkel. Why is he there? Because he's he's on the show, man. He's in the opening credits. He's got to be there. Okay. I guess that's a reason. Um, but they go to the dance. There's so much dancing. Uh, Harriet looks amazing, by the way, in her dress. Uh, beautiful. They do a pretty good dance routine. Pretty good. Um, it was okay. Wasn't as good as the Big Ragu and his wife. No, clearly better. The Big Ragu's performance and his wife, so much better. Well, the episode would disagree with you. The episode does disagree with me, yes. Because what happens in the course of they this dance-off? They tie. There's a tie It's somehow. a tie, and it shouldn't have happened. Shouldn't be a tie. And, and for you know, they, they do a bait and switch because they reward it to the Big Ragu. And they, they, they pause. And then they also award it to, to Carl. Carl. Um, but um, so at, at first I was like, yeah, great, perfect. They actually went with the, the actual winner, the better dancer that we saw anyway. Um, so the fact that it was a tie, yeah. It was kind of off-putting for me. Didn't sure. like it. Sure. But because it's a tie, a dance-off is declared. Damn right. Which I guess is they're 
are they supposed to dance at the same time? I'm not. I believe they were. They were. They had to perform the jitterbug at the same time, and we would be able to compare and contrast, and then one couple would be named the winner. But we don't get to because for some reason when the dance off is declared, they all take a bow <laughs> to say thank you yeah. prior, prior to this tiebreaker. And when they do so, Carl, who earlier in the episode was hanging on a door, throws his back out again. That's right. And when this happens, it's becoming increasingly clear that he's not going to be able to dance with Harriet. The big ragu taunts him about this, like cruelly makes fun of him in front of everybody and then turns and trips over a chair to twist his ankle? He sure does. So now it's a crippled dance-off. Yeah, he can't put any weight on that thing. And so what happens? What happens is these men will not give up. And so they both attempt to dance on their uh, with their injuries to mm-hmm. some comedic effect. The audience seems to like this too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it's especially I think for Carl, you're rooting for Carl... You want to see that he pulls this off, or, and and you're hoping that through this injury, perhaps forced to, to dance in a certain style, uh, might win over the judges. Um, but it gets it gets called off by the big ragu's wife. And then this, you can't touch this place, and all the kids come out and dance. Yep. And then after that, they go home for a banana split and some sex play. I think involving Carl's harness. Yep. And that's the episode. That's the episode. No tag or, or closing credits bit. And I don't know, no real, like, it's about the folks at this point. Yeah, this one was about the folks. I liked it. I liked it this more than Full House because it, it felt more like a family. I don't know. Maybe because, and I'm just sorry to say this, maybe because there's a mom and dad there. I just, did you think of this, like, is this the kind of show you would watch a family sitcom in ninth grade? Yeah, I think it, I think it is. I think it's the kind I was watching uh, in the 80s, and so it was carrying over into the 90s. Do you have fond memories of Family Matters? No, I, I don't. I don't really have fond memories of Family Matters. It never thrilled me growing up. Now, do your kids watch it? I know they watch Full House reruns. Do they watch Family Matters reruns? No, they, we haven't gotten into the Family Matters. I had to explain because we watched the Urkel episode recently of Full House. And so who is exp- this comical genius? Yeah. So I had to explain who Urkel was. And they were like, we know who Urkel is, Dad, because he's mentioned in The Simpsons. They watch The Simpsons. And so oh, they're like... Oh, so they picked up yeah. on it. So they picked up on Urkel. It's like from- how I learned who John F. Kennedy was. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. What show was that from for you? John F. Kennedy? Yeah. I think he's featured in the film JFK. <laughs> okay. That's Got probably it. where I first saw it. I'm like, oh, I get that's That's... That's who that that's is. where that's from. Got it. Yeah. But oh, and one, he's in a Zapruder film as well. I forget which one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he's in all the frames. He's in most of the frames. Um, I think he dips you out asked, of there for a second. <laughs> Whoops. Jesus Christ. <laughs> you don't see a boom mic, but you might as well. Oh, man. We'll return after these messages. Hey everyone ever, this is Tim Blevins, and you're probably expecting me to name drop some obscure comic book artist or reference that forgotten TV series no one else is watching. But what if I got a little more intimate? Maybe discuss the existential horror of a Muppet breaking the fourth wall, or that specific fetish derived from watching Donatello do machines. These are the topics of Menage a Pop, a new podcast wherein I and a guest have a consensual discussion on the pop culture that most impacted their personal development. It's part of the Not A Holograms podcast network and begins airing three times a week on May 4th. You'll find it on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, as well as the homepage of nahpods.com. Tune in, subscribe, and start to analyze the psychological ramifications of your partner's casingle your co-worker's card game, and your house cat's cosplay. It's Menage a Pop, premiering this May 4th. Not a hologram, it's a podcast. Back to the show. 
Uh, but you asked it, was I, th- I can't remember how you phrased it, if I was thrilled. By I said Zapruder matters. film. No, I'm talking about Family Matters. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I, I, Family Matters, I don't have fond memories. That's what you said. Don't. I don't have these fond memories of Family Matters. But I do have fond memories of the show that follows Family Matters. The 9 o'clock TGIF program? That's the one. What followed Family Matters? Perfect Strangers. Perfect Strangers. I, yeah. I, this is a show I watched. I watched this show. I don't know if I watched this season. I didn't because I don't remember watching this on Friday nights. This show premiered on Wednesdays originally. Yeah. Premiered in 1986. And I feel like it's on TGIF, Kids Family Block. You're saying family, so I should make that distinction. Thank I feel you. like Perfect Strangers originally was aimed at adults. I think it was. And I think from what I read after the Winter Olympics of uh, 1989 or 90, after that, it moved. Uh, oh, 1988. Yeah, it moved to Friday nights. Go then, hurry up. We got to pack. Pack? For what? I just got the news. We're moving to Friday night. Okay, we're not moving. We're not? No, they're moving our show to Friday night, but we're staying right here in Chicago. Wait a minute. We're staying right here in our apartment? Right. But Perfect Strangers is moving to Friday night? That's right. Now, do you understand? Well, of course I do. Don't be ridiculous. Good. Question. How are they moving this whole apartment building to Friday night? They have a big truck. It's a new night for Perfect Strangers. I feel like maybe it sort of became more of a of a of maybe a kid's show. Like I don't know. Do you you weren't watching it at this point? What do you remember Perfect Strangers as? I know we've done two episodes that involve Perfect Strangers prior to yeah, this. Yeah, I mean Perfect Strangers to me was was Balky, you know, and and so I was watching it in season one, um, season two, for sure, probably season three. Um, but yeah, like to me, it was just this this weird, funny uh, foreigner. Um, trying to fit in with his American cousin. That's what I absolutely loved at that age of of uh, Perfect Strangers. Okay. Well, take us through this episode then, because this is an episode I don't think yeah. either one of us had seen before. I hadn't but this seen is this an episode one. that aired when you were in ninth grade on TGIF. Yeah, I didn't I didn't see this one, sir. Um I know that I did watch Perfect Strangers when when they moved and were working at the at the newspaper, because I do remember that. And Which I do is remember, this one. Okay. Yeah, and I do remember uh, Harriet being a cast member um, and then getting spun off. So um, this might have been the season that I stopped watching Perfect Strangers or at least faded away. In this episode, um, Balky agrees to babysit uh, the daughter of a new tenant of the building where they're living. Named, Girl's probably uh, Tess. Yeah. Um, she's probably nine or ten, I guess. I feel like she's basically Stephanie from Full House. Uh, yeah, Stephanie. Basically, yeah, and it, uh, you might know, is it the same actress that plays Curly Sue in the mo- movie Curly Sue? She reminded me. Oh, I don't know, and strangely, I was just telling Allison today how I once saw Curly Sue, the movie, in the theater. That's <laughs> well, weird. I don't know if it's the same performer. We, sh- we should look that up as we're talking. Senator Curly Sue? No, Senator but, uh, Curly Sue. But um, she's, uh, yeah, she's a loud kid. She's a loud, obnoxious, pain in the ass kid, and lo and behold, he promised to to babysit this kid the same night that Larry um, was ready to write this this tell all article about some mob mafia guy who's big doing Jim some, Morris, big Jim Morris doing some dirty dealings with with the government. Um, and he's got all these notes and he's going to put this together and he's so excited and all he needs is some peace and quiet to get this this uh, article done so he can submit it for the next day. And oh shit, you've got Tess over and she is just an obnoxious little brat. She's a brat because Balky's a bad babysitter. Yeah, he's just letting her do what she does because that is the Naposian. I don't even remember where he lives. Where does he live? Mepos. Where is he? He's Mepos. Naposian. He's a Mepo- Mepoet. Mipoit, from Posia, and, yeah. and it is Mipoit tra- tradition to let the children run free and to never say no to the children. That is how he grew up. That is the law of his land. And so he was applying that to this situation, never saying no. Which is odd. I wouldn't expect this from the show. I never think of Balky with kids or being around kids. Yeah. It's not the go-to. It was, it was again, kind of just this one-off. It's a very odd night of of comedy that we're watching here so far, Tim, because Full House was sort of out of its element, I think, in this IQ Man episode. Um, it was more about sexing on on Jesse, which isn't the normal thing that the show would do. Sexing on Jesse. Yes. And Family Matters, 
again, kind of a one-off dance contest thing that isn't really plot pertinent to the rest of what the series is. Sexing and, on the big ragu. Yeah, and now we're at, at Perfect Strangers, where a child is introduced into this pair, uh, which, again, isn't normally what we see. The child, by the way, is introduced right before a very strange pedophile joke. Did you catch that? I did not. Could you please repeat it? I hope you have it written down. Um, well, because Larry, the, the article that Larry is ex- thrilled to write that Balky's poor choice in babysitting is, is throwing to the curb um, is, is about a guy named Big uh, Jim Morris. And Larry actually is, is explaining to Balky that what oh, his the big alderman? lead is. Yeah, he says he saw uh. the guy talking to the alderman. To which Balky responds that his mother always told him to stay away from older men. Right. That's that's clever so wordplay. Yeah. It also points out that Balky doesn't understand anything Larry says. No, that's not a, a bit. big runner in this episode. But that I don't know. Given the the family nature of the of the night and the shows that preceded it, even though I knew Perfect Strangers as a different show than this, that seemed a little. Uh, I don't know that that that's I was surprised by that. I, it's yeah. a funny enough joke, and it sort of reminded me what I do like about the show. The two of them have a good Abbott and Costello kind of chemistry, where most of their jokes are whatever Larry says, Balky doesn't get. Yeah, but I, I don't mind that. But no, I don't. I mean, I don't understand why Larry doesn't work in the bedroom, but he can't. Right, um, right. Eventually. That was all I was thinking this entire it time. Was. It's like oh, just okay. go close your bedroom door and you'll be fine. You know, but okay. Eventually, he goes to work at the office, and when he returns, uh, Balky is uh, tied and gagged atop a kitchen table. Which I thought was kind of a funny uh, visual. You did. For for what was happening. Yeah. I thought it was hot. <laughs> I thought the whole episode was going to take place in one night in the house. It made sense. It's that kind of thing. But the plot moves to their place of work the following day. Correct. Probably because they have to show all these other characters, but... The next day at the paper, it sounds like Larry's going to get his article published. Yeah. With one caveat. He has to cut it down in length. A little bit. hundred words. He's got 15 minutes to do it. D- does anything... Do you think anything gets in the way of this? Like, what What? What could maybe well, make that... Well, He's a journalist, so he yeah. should know how to edit his own work He should down. be able to do it just fine. But, but surprise, surprise, Balky is babysitting Tess again. And since Balky has to work, Tess has come to work with him. And she is fucking this place up oh totally she presses all the elevator buttons mm-hmm. uh, she puts barbie dolls in the mail chute she takes larry's watch she uh graffitis one of the uh, other employees there yes yeah, as tess was here yeah she puts peanut butter and jelly all over a phone <laughs> she puts a chocolate bar in a letter and she turns on the sprinklers yeah which would cause thousands of dollars in damages. Yeah. Causing the... Sh- actually, yeah. let me just say, because I, I literally thought that it's like they had to decide that this was a funny enough gag for the show to have these sprinklers installed so they could spray water on the set and essentially ruin the set. They're going to have to clean that up. So and, the context of the production of the show, they're ruining yeah, the set. Like, like yes. I, I, it took me out of the show. And into like the 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 logistics of that and the decision that had to be made. You write this script that involves sprinklers that that are on and so powerful that it actually prevents the paper from printing that day. That's the thing. Yeah, and she shut down the Chicago Chronicle. Yeah, they can't publish. Can you think of a time when a newspaper didn't publish? No, I would say eh, when New York was attacked. Maybe I would say maybe with a hurricane. I'd say maybe during maybe during World War II. That's a big deal that this kid just shut down. I think Larry said like just one other time in the eighty year history of the paper or something to that effect. But there's no real consequence other than Larry doesn't get his article published. No, but there is a lesson learned. So what happens? They go back to the apartment. That I remember. But yeah. but, but, but what what occurs next? Essentially Balky learns that he needs to say no. Mm-hmm. And then she comes over to apologize. Tess does. Mm-hmm. Brings some cookies. Nice. Probably funny cookies. Yeah. And uh, Balky takes this moment to sit Tess down. And oh my God, the, the, the music comes in. The strings <laughs> kind of like just backing this, this 
lesson for both Balky and for Tess, because I can't even remember what Balky says to her exactly, but he's telling Tess that she can't do the things she does. Well, and- she gets sad because she thinks they can't be friends anymore. Yeah, she apparently feels a little guilty for putting the, 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 the peanut butter on the phone and turning on the sprinklers and everything. Yeah. It, it's ridiculous that it's such a sappy lesson at the end of the episode, because you expect that more from a full house or a family matters. Oh, okay. But here it is in, in Perfect Strangers of all places. Yeah, he he. You're right. They both learn a lesson. He asks her to apologize uh, to, to to cousin Larry, uncle cousin Larry, uncle cousin Larry, who accepts the apology, but does say she's going to have to be a little more careful. So he gives her a, he gets his little dig in there, and what we find out um, after she leaves, as the episode's about to wrap up, is that she is a terror child. <laughs> Because after everything they've been through, this whole lesson, like you're saying with the music, she apparently lives right above them. And after Larry and Balky have a little conversation, Tess calls from outside the window above. She asks Larry to come to the window. He leans his head out of their, I don't know, fifth floor window. And she drenches him with a deluge of water from the floor above. Right. And that's how it ends. That's it. That's how this perfect stranger's episode end and i have no recollection of this kid coming back into the series like i really don't know she got swept up into that curly sue saga i guess i guess but it's like such an odd one-off kind of thing to have i hope she never came back but i agree i i think subscribers to the uh, chicago chronicle feel the same yeah uh, what did you think of this as a Perfect Strangers episode? Not my typical, not the kind of Perfect Strangers episode I wanted to see. It was more the hijinks of this kid and then everybody reacting to that, which isn't what I expect from Perfect Strangers. And I think it's because these characters aren't parents. They're Correct. kids. They're like Ernie and Bert. Yeah. I don't think we need to see them being adults, but I think for this show, this is what I'm wondering, for Perfect Strangers to fit this family formula that you in ninth grade were watching on TGIF. What? I think this I is... love that you keep pointing that out, but yeah, okay. Well, that's when this one aired. <laughs> it aired when you were in ninth grade. You're in ninth grade and you that's were watching correct. this when this one aired. <laughs> yeah, that's true. When this one first aired, these four programs, Full House, <laughs> The Family Matters, these these family shows, you were in ninth grade watching them. That's, that's that, the date that that's it happened. The date. You that's were 15. Ni- 1990. 16. 16. Uh, you, were, yeah. you, could, you could drive to anyone's house you wanted to watch this. 16. What was that? I had just recently turned 16. Okay. So, yeah. So, you were probably relating to which character? DJ the most, probably. DJ the most, because DJ was, what, 12? (laughs) No, she was probably 16, 15. Okay. So, very similar. Very similar. (laughs) Um, I don't know. This, I... uh, I want to say that I love Perfect Strangers. I want to think that I love Perfect Strangers, but this episode sucked. Yeah, it did. And we I did. Laugh. We did like Perfect Strangers, Tim. We did seasons one through three, probably. Mm-hmm. Okay. When this we one were I did, younger. We were younger. I think they were older. <laughs> I think this show took a dip. I think it was. Tr- it knew it had kids as an audience. So it was trying to maintain the Family Matters audience. That's why I just feel like Tess is such a Full House character. And you're right. It, it didn't work. It didn't fit. It was talking down to the original fan base of Perfect Strangers. Th- those of us who were driving, for example. <laughs> Which is why, if you were in ninth grade sticking it out for TGIF, I think you watched Full House, you enjoyed it. Sometimes Family Matters, Family Show, Perfect Strangers let you down. I think this night, this night in 1990, you being 16 and hopping around in your car, I bet you enjoyed the last program, the 9.30 East Coast time entry into this lineup, right? Well, I got to tell you, Tim, I mean, I was I was 16 at that time, if you recall. In uh, 1990, when this block of TGIF were discussing that you watched was on. Yeah. So I was yeah. actually, uh, my, my bedtime was at 9.30. So wait, what? I, I did not get to see the next, I don't know when my bedtime was at that time. Okay. I, but at 16 and on a Friday night, I can tell you that I did not watch this uh, last episode because I did not even know this program existed until you've you, never heard of you going point. places. Never heard of it. You've never heard of going places. No recollection of it. I mentioned it to my wife. She was like, Oh, yeah, I kind of remember that. But not me. 
I kind of didn't remember any of it. Well, let me tell you. Did you recall it be- before I you were doing this research? did recall going places. Oh my God. Not by name, but by structure and characters. And let me tell you then a little bit about going places. Please do. Prior to us discussing uh, growing, going places. Uh, going places was a one season show that has very little information online about it. <laughs> What I can tell you from what we watched, um, it's about four TV writers. They write for oh like a candid camera I did show. Not, I, did not, I did not realize that. I, that I, might be online. I may have gotten there, that from There online. were two of them. I got it from two of them during this episode, but okay. All four of them. All four wow. of them are, are, are writers. And it was created actually by two writers from Perfect Strangers, which might be why it was paired with Perfect Strangers. And honestly, I remember watching this because I recognized the cast. It's got Jerry Levine, who I would have known as Styles and Teen Wolf. It's got Alan Ruck, who I would know as Cameron on Ferris Bueller. Yeah. It's got Heather Locklear, who later is pretty brilliant on Spin City, and at this point, I guess, was T.J. Hooker. Is that? Yeah, she, she was in T.J. Hooker. That's where I remember Dynasty, Heather maybe. And then, actually, the one character who I like the most um, is a performer named Haley Todd, who I didn't know. But I guess she was on a lot of 80s sitcoms guesting. She was on a show called Brothers. She plays a mom on Lizzie McGuire. You liked but, um, her the most in Of this the episode. four that were there. You liked the character or the actress? I liked some of the lines she said. All right. I liked the fact that she was in a scene with Holland Taylor. Do you like Holland Taylor? She's I like in the Holland show. Holland Taylor, yeah. I yeah. was surprised to see Holland Taylor. And I think there's one more person in this. See, I was not surprised because Holland Taylor, she's in most, you know her from the Naked <laughs> she's in Truth, most shows. Saved by the Bell, Two and a Half Men. And she's a great performer. She knows yeah. how to make this kind of stuff work. So, of course, you want her on this show. Right. Um, the show also had my late 80s crush, uh, Stacey Keenan of My Two Dads. I That blew me out of the water when I saw her in this. Well, what blew me out of the water is I could not quite figure out why she's on the show. Don't know why she's there. She's in their house. The four characters, the main characters, not Holland Taylor, but the four that we discussed, they live together. This is a house they live in? This is a house, right? Yeah. On the, they're in California? I'll be honest. When, when I've, again, first time I've ever seen this. Going places. I the one thought, season hit from Writers to Perfect Strangers. Exactly. I, I was trying to place the, this location. It, to me, felt like it was the lobby of some sort of, um, I don't want to call it an inn per se, but- but just as a residence, almost like an apartment building, and they were in the lobby. And you're saying that's not the lobby, that's just their living room. I think it's their house. They got a kitchen. That is a fucked up house, man. That was They've got the one fireplace in Los Angeles. Yeah, it's just they got it, it to me it looks like the lobby of a of a hotel, like a fancy a residence place. It's almost like Bloom County or something. It's like everybody's living in the house together. That's how you tell you're going places. I guess so. Well, what did you think? I mean, this uh, the reason I'm saying I bet you like this show is I feel like this is a dirty show <laughs> for my TGIF. This is adults. Yeah, this is this is where the kids have gone to bed and the, the adults are still up and, and they don't want to get up. Or and... maybe the 16-year-olds who have a license nope, and are they, in ninth grade are going to watch this. They have because... brushed their teeth and they are in bed now listening to uh, 93Q as they fall asleep. Oh, I'm sorry because I think this show, had you stayed for going places... I mean, well, it starts with some sweet saxophone. And what we're getting is these four adults, their crazy life. Alan Ruck is there and he's setting up Monopoly for the night because that's an adult game. He says the word hat like five times. (laughs) And the guy who plays Styles in uh, Teen Wolf, he's going out because he dates. We learned that he's probably the smooth guy. He's pretty risque. He can pick up girls while turning and coughing is a line that somebody said. I don't I still don't understand that. So when you go to a doctor's no, office, I, I understand what you do, but yeah. I don't understand how that, like, what, how that makes him better. He can just pick people up when his balls are in their hands. I think. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess. And he's going out to, on a date. I think Heather Locklear, who doesn't get much to do in this, sadly, she's going out on a date. So um, Alan Ruck and this other girl, who I guess is my favorite. They're going to play Monopoly. And then it breaks for the opening theme. And my God, I couldn't wait to see what these adults were going to do. I remember this show being mocked on another ABC show. 
I remember one of my favorite shows, Anything But Love, making a joke about ABC being the network that gave us Heather Locklear as a comedy writer. And we were supposed to laugh at that. This show was not even liked by its own network. And I can tell you why Going Places didn't work. It fails the Beckdale test immediately. Every scene starts with, there isn't a single guy, a single girl that you're interested in. That's what the show is. Yeah. I mean, what what happens in this? Can you can you recall? I can, can you relate I can to me what happened in going recall, places? But they they go to the singles club and they don't. Alan Ruck and the girl that I like go to the singles yeah, club. Yeah, and and they they do not find matches. Uh, they do not. So they they bail. are not going places. They bail on that. Uh, then they I think they complain about it the next day, or or um, uh, Haley Todd complains about it the next day. Who's and that's Haley when, Todd? Uh, isn't that the actress that... Uh... Yes, I'm sorry. I thought you were referring to Holland Taylor by some bizarre name. Yes, <laughs> no. Haley Todd's the character that I like. That, that's the one that you like. I don't remember her character name, uh, but I wrote Haley down Todd. her real name. Um, but then Holland Taylor shows up, and that's where I was like, oh, shit, Holland Taylor. And she shows She's up. She's a sexual predator. Totally, and tells her her advice on how to get men, and it's, uh, it's uh, singles ads. Put an ad in the paper. The simplest way... To meet people out here is through these. Personal ads? Oh, I could never put a personal ad in a magazine. It's so... It's so... Desperate? <laughs> no. Well, yes. Oh, really? Does this sound desperate to you? Attractive redhead, fabulous figure, wants to share time with a man interested in sports. Both outdoor and indoor. Gosh, bet every guy in town answers that ad. Just about. Now, is this how personal ads work? I have no idea. Okay, yeah, I've never had one. Yeah, but um, and then in that scene, just to kind of put it out there, uh, my two dad's daughter is there. Yeah, I don't know why. Don't it's, know it's why. almost as if she's waiting to film my two dads. And yeah, because she also doesn't look all that much more grown up. And so I can't place like what her age is supposed to be in this show. I feel like my two dads must have just ended because I think that ran till the beginning of 1990. But yeah. you're right. I don't know her age. I don't know why she's there. I'm not even sure why Holland Taylor's there, to be perfectly honest. Is she also a writer? I think she owns the building they're in. Okay. And she might somehow be connected with the show. I don't know. So yeah, then um, Haley Todd... I can't remember if she put an ad out or if she answered an ad, but she ends up having a date and it doesn't go well. And, and all this time, it leaves Alan Ruck behind. And I'd like, I think you get the, the setup that Alan and, and Haley are supposed to end up together. Does this make you miss the dating world? This show uh, going places? No. Do you miss the kind of... You don't. No. not the, Well, this show doesn't make me miss it. No. Okay. I mean, I, I, I say I don't miss the dating world. I miss the friends fumbling about kind of like this in other shows established, but sure. this is probably why I would have liked Going Places if I had watched it more at the time. Because I think I did like these plots, the kind of plots, and this is early in the series where, you know, the character, you know, they wind up with someone through forced contrivances mm -hmm. instead of, you know, I don't know, risking and asking someone out. And that's how high school romance worked in my mind. And, and, and I think... Because of that, what they're setting up here with these two characters, which are doing such a great job of describing, I, both of us really enjoyed uh, going places. Um, I think it's why this sitcom would have worked. I get why this isn't TGIF if you're trying to hold on to an older audience. I feel like even as a kid watching this, I would think, oh, that's how adults act. If I was a little younger and the show was on, like if I was 10... Or like if you were 10 and this was my evening of TV, your evening of TV, I do think I would have liked this. So I kind of get why it's in the block. Kind of get why it's there. I don't, I don't see it. I can't, I can't put myself there. I don't, I don't see why it's in the block. Uh, aside from the fact that it's from Miller Boyette, which brought us um, the preceding shows, uh, Perfect Strangers and Family, uh, Family Matters. What do you recall being in the slot? You used to watch TGIF when you were in ninth grade. What do you remember being the fourth show of the night? Um, I, I don't, I don't know what the fourth show of the night would be. I remember eventually, I think Sabrina the Teenage Witch uh, was on, 
Um, but I don't know. That seemed to me like that was earlier in the evening because I did see that before my bedtime. Did you watch this block for all four episodes? When you no, were I never did. Grade? You didn't? No. Oh. So this wasn't must-see TV for you. No, no, no. It was not. How? Oh. You know, at the s- start of the episode, that was the direction I thought we were going. Really? I thought you were going to talk about how you miss programming blocks like this. I, do, I did enjoy programming blocks sometimes. Mostly the Thursday night NBC must, must see. Um, but I didn't go into, I wasn't into blocks at this age. I was more a fan of individual series that in this case just happened to be on within this block. So, so the idea of TGIF doesn't resonate with you. It's not a memory of yours. I, I mean, I guess it sort of was because I watched the first two for sure. And then sometimes okay. I hang out okay. for the third. Um, and so there were the TGIF ads and the whole nomenclature that I would remember and, and see. And, and so, yeah, there was some TGIF vibes, but um, it wasn't the reason I was t- tuning in. I was fans of Full House, you know, the, the four seasons before TGIF even existed. So the branding of it to use that word, and then the creation of it wasn't the draw. That's interesting and would have changed what we were talking about if I had listened and realized that. I'm sorry. I do kind of miss having a little less control of what I'm watching. Yeah. I guess. is what I agree with that. Out, you do. Yeah. M- more for my children do I agree with that. Mm-hmm. Um, I do not like their viewing habits. And I know I should control that better, but it's, it's you know, you get into a groove and they're into a groove of watching basically the same thing over and over again, mm-hmm. as opposed to being introduced to something that you might not typically seek out. But now there it is, like you're saying with these blocks, you stick around for the one or two that you know and that you like, and then you're just sort of obligated in a way to stay there for, you know, the, the single guy. Ouch. Sorry, Jonathan Silverman. I- I thought that was our usual go-to complaint, the single guy. Yes, yeah, so just normally he's not here listening. He's my next guest. <laughs> Got it. The weird thing with that is, though, I and I think we even saw this with friends, the downside or the other side or the reality of block programming is when you choose to watch a block program, you are giving up some choice because you're watching some crap. You're watching the single guy to get to Seinfeld or you're watching Seinfeld to get to Inside Schwartz. You know, you're putting up with something and not even probably testing the waters or, or t- feeling out if you like it or not. It's just part of it. And I feel like this TGIF, I could easily have seen how some of these shows were just part of it. I come for the full house. I stay for the family matters. That's actually tricky programming because if you're not in the perfect strangers, they've lost you for an hour. But if you kind of connect it in some way, maybe you sit through. You know, I got to get off the TV before 2020, but I'll watch these four shows. That's a thing for my youth I can't get back with streaming or DVDs on demand. And I like watching TV that way too, but I don't know. I sometimes miss the take what they give you art of that. And that's weird. That's weird. It is weird, but it's what we know. You know, it's what we grew up with. It's what we're familiar with. It has, uh, as weird as it might sound, I think it has a warmth to it. You know, I miss that feeling of sitting there and, and just taking what they give you and either enjoying it. I guess you can change the channel, but you're going to find that one, that block, like you're saying, that is as close to the things that you like as, as possible. And so that's where you sit and that's where you stay. And you're usually, at least me, doing it with the family Maybe it's Friday night and you get a snack that night, uh, a little dessert or something. Um, a little dessert, though. Let's not go overboard. Wow, you got snacks once a week? I used to. It would be a bag of M&Ms that I would sit on the floor, divide into the different colors, and then eat them from the smallest number of colors to the largest number of colors. So there's a ritual that goes with these blocks. That, that was my block ritual. Yes, sir. Maybe that's what, we, what we're missing. I think we are. Hmm. Do you think you could create one with your daughters? Do you think you create I some rituals have, with their I have, habits? I have tried. I mean, we have family TV time. Um, but instead of it being the thing that I wanted it to be, where we watch two or three different um, episodes of something 
before bed. We end up watching three full house before bed. So it is this binge culture. Um, or we'll watch three Malcolm in the middles um, instead of one full house, one Malcolm, one Sabrina, the teenage witch or something. Now, do they try to go do in wanting to watch three or is it just to get caught up in it? Like- uh, no, I mean, it's a, it's like a seven thirty to nine kind of block, uh, seven fifteen to eight forty five. That's kind of when we watch the TV. And so it usually just times out to three episodes. But they want to stick with Full House. And they laugh, man. They laugh a lot at Full House. So it's, so they enjoy it, which I guess is ultimately the goal with any of these shows. I I wonder, and, I, and we can't tell, but I do wonder if I was 10 and this is how TV worked, I wonder what my relationship with TV would be. I wonder if my pref- preference would be show me another Will and Grace versus show me all four shows that are on tonight. Should have said Mr. Belvedere there to make it relevant. Makes sense, though. People get it. I hope they do. Did you get it, people? They sure do. Okay. Well, if you want to get it again, or if you want to get this, get what? Get this show. Are we done? It feels like we're done since you've started the, the closing. Well, did you have more to say about the topic? I think I've I've uh, recounted these episodes quite a bit here. Yeah, I think we spent a lot of time discussing shows we didn't want to watch. <laughs> but if you want to watch it, or if you want to hear us maybe discuss something we do want to watch, why not check out the new website, www.nahpods.com. That's... Not nah pods is in not a hologram podcasts. It's uh, the main web page for uh, for this show, 20th Century Pop, as well as some upcoming and new shows, which we'll talk about at some point in the future. Um, you can always find the most recent episode there uh, streaming, as well as links to all of our past episodes, so you can catch up on those if you want to hear an older episode. Or best of all, best thing you could do, best way you could support us right now. If you haven't already, subscribe to the show. We're on Apple Podcasts, we're on Stitcher, we're on Spotify, we're on a lot of different podcast catchers. And, uh, you know, that way you get a new episode whenever one comes up, which is every other week, plus a rerun episode on those off weeks. Um, you can also follow us on Instagram at 20popcast. You can follow us on Twitter also at 20popcast. And you can hear me segue to asking Bob if he has anything he wants to do right here and now. Sure, I, I will say that you can follow me on Twitter at RH Canning. And I'd love to uh, hear from you and also you and then the other people listening. Um, what was your take on TGIF? What were your favorite um, series from, from this block? And what other television blocks did you enjoy in the reviews? Well, I'm sorry, Tim. Hmm? But that's what I want to know. Television blocks. I know. I think that's great. I just think the phrase television <laughs> blocks. Funny. I see. Okay. Well, this went well. Thanks for uh, what, thanks for listening. What was the new heart block? There was a block around new heart. I remember. There was. Uh, I think it was new heart. Then followed by designing women, maybe. Yeah. And was it or Murphy Brown? Or, oh, that might have been or, there. Or, or maybe Mego. Was Mego a thing yet with Brunch and Pinchot? Or, or maybe Man of the People? Start oh, raving so man mad. Of the people. Bewitched. Dave. Dave. I don't know Dave. That was the uh, Harry Anderson? Dave Barry? Oh, Dave's World. Dave's World, that's it. Thanks. Yes. No, that was, that was later, unless there's a later Bob Newhart show. Blocks. That's a good ending. I like that. I was tender to my flock of sheep. My mind was bent and couldn't get no sleep. I was dreaming of a world I knew. If I could get to it, my dreams come true. So I packed up and I said goodbye to my mama. And across the sky to a new land Where they work and play With course in love each and every day
thrilling. Cause my dreams are fulfilling and I'm chilling. New ground beside me and I'm willing to go to the top. And that's why I'm telling y'all not to stop. The same. Don't go cooking up the brand new game. Just reach for what you got inside. Cause you're your own. Take it to ride. Fresh, fresh, young. 